All right, good morning, Grace Gospel Church. Good morning, so good to see you today. I'm going to invite you to stand as we read a passage from God's Word this morning to open up our service together. Psalm 105, it says this. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his wonders. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. Seek the Lord in his strength and seek his face continually. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord be glad. We can be glad this morning in our, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We can be glad. We can be worshipful this morning. We can praise his name because he alone is worthy to be praised. And we get to enter into a time of worship where we do that together. And so I'm going to invite you to pray with me as we enter into a time of worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful to be here this morning. So thankful to be able to gather in your name and to worship you. God, we pray that as we worship you, you would just limit everything that is not of you in this place this morning, that we would focus on who you are. God, because we are a people in desperate need of you and less of us, God. So help us to cling to you. Help us to seek your face in worship this morning. God, we love you. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Let's worship together.
just thank you for who you are. And your name is worthy to be praised. We're just so thankful that we have this opportunity to worship you because you deserve it all. You deserve all the honor and the glory. We just bring our offering to you. You know, before we sing this next song, um, it talks about God's amazing grace and how true that is. He has amazing grace for us, regardless of where we come from, regardless of our past. He has that grace extended towards us because he loves us and he died for each of us if we accept him. And so as we sing this next song, just really 
Sing the words. Believe the words. And sing with us. We are in awe of that amazing grace that you give. Your unending love for us, unfailing love that you display for us, God, in sending your son for us to die a death that we deserve, to die on our behalf, and to rise again on the third day, conquering sin, conquering death, God, so that if we believe, we may be saved. God, we are so thankful, so grateful for your love for us. We can love because you first loved us. 
God, we thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory for who you are. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, well, good morning once again, Grace Gospel. So good to see you. Good morning to those of you joining us on our live stream this morning. We are glad that you are with us as well. Uh, if you are new or a visitor or have been here for a little bit of time, uh, we do have welcome cards, visitor cards in every seat pocket in front of you. And so I just invite you to fill that out and you can either leave that on your seat after the service or you can place that in one of our offering boxes, one up here on the front wall and then one on the back wall as you uh, exit after the service. And so that's just so we can get to know you a little bit better. You can get to know a little bit more about who we are here at Grace Gospel Church. And you can fill that out even if you just have some information to update uh, your email, phone number, address, any of that kind of stuff to update for our records. And so uh, we can keep you in the loop. We send a newsletter out every single week of all the ministry that is happening here at Grace and all the events that we have going on. So uh, that's one good way to stay connected uh, here at Grace Gospel Church. We do have two ministries that happen downstairs uh, during the service. Uh, one is Kingdom Kids and the other is Super Church. Uh, Kingdom Kids is for those uh, from newborn to preschool and Super Church for kindergarten through sixth grade. So kids, you are now uh, dismissed to go ahead down for either of those ministries. All right, we do have a few announcements, a lot of announcements actually, to, to run through this morning. So bear with me. All of this information uh, is in your bulletin, so just know that. And uh, so just bear with me here. All right, so one, uh, we do have a time of fellowship after service. We will not be outside. We'll be downstairs uh, to enjoy fellowship together, some coffee, goodies, bagels, that kind of thing. Uh, so be sure to join us after the service. Uh, tomorrow, anybody have any idea what's happening right here at Grace Gospel Church tomorrow afternoon? Faith and, you guys are so good. Faith in Blue is happening tomorrow right here at Grace Gospel Church, 3.30 to 5.30, an event that we are partnering uh, with the Suffolk PD to put on uh, for our community around us. So 3.30 to 5.30 uh, is what you need to know. And then um, wear your Grace Gospel t-shirts. If you're like, what's a Grace Gospel t-shirt, we will get you one of those tomorrow. So just be aware of that. Uh, come ready to serve. It's going to be a really, really cool day as we get to partner with Suffolk PD to serve our community. Uh, we do ask in terms of parking, we're asking nobody to park uh, in our parking lot as we will have um, stuff all throughout our parking lot, games, um, you know, again, Suffolk PD is going to be here, so they'll have a bunch of stuff, police cars and that kind of thing. Uh, so don't park in our parking lot. Uh, you are more than welcome to park on the street, just not right in front of our building or across from our building, all right? So down the street a little bit, on a side street somewhere, uh, and then uh, come here. So uh, if you can... You know, we get that, you know, you're working and that kind of thing, a lot of us. And so, um, you know, if you're like, okay, when should I be here? I can be here anytime. Uh, be here by 2.30. We'd love for everyone to be here by 2, 2.30. And, uh, again, if you want to come earlier, help set up, get ready, you can do that. Uh, if you have to come a little later with work or anything like that, um, that's okay, too. So uh, just get here when you can if you know you're going to make it. Uh, you can still sign up for Faith in Blue to serve. Uh, if you didn't know until today that you are going to serve at Faith in Blue, you can sign up. Um, we are still, you know, open to having a few more games, again, all throughout our parking lot set up, and so uh, if you can do that, or if you have a game that we can use, uh, let myself know, and we'll get that uh, used. Uh, let Miss Tammy know, and uh, we'll get that. So uh, the other thing would be desserts. So we've at, we're asking, you know, if anyone can make uh, homemade goodies, homemade desserts that are individually wrapped, uh, please do that. So I don't know, you know, we made this announcement last week. We said you can bring them today. So if you've done that, thank you. And uh, if you can bring it tomorrow, or you can bring it tomorrow morning, like whenever you can bring it, even if you're not going to be at Faith in Blue, uh, we would love to have uh, some of those goodies for our event tomorrow. All right? If you have questions with Faith in Blue, uh, come see me, uh, come see Tammy, and we'll get you connected and all the information that you need with that. Uh, life groups are back. We've had a couple meeting for a couple weeks now. Uh, very exciting. We have one starting up in Sayville this week, uh, Wednesday the 13th, uh, from 7.15 to 9.00. I believe, and it's actually intentionally uh, scheduled for 7.15 because uh, we have youth group that meets right here at 7 o'clock, and so for youth parents, you can uh, you know, get, dro get drop your kids off here at 7 o'clock and make it to the Saveville group that starts at 7.15 and be done in time to pick up your uh, youth here from the church, so it uh, just works out really, really well for any youth parents that are looking to attend a life group. Men's dinner. We have men's dinner scheduled for the 15th, Friday the 15th at 6.30 at Rich Benelli's home. I believe there's a sign-up on the back table uh, for you, so men, uh, be sure to sign up today if you know you're going to be at the men's dinner. 
few more. We're rolling. I think there's like three more. Soundview Pregnancy, uh, their dinner, this, this big event that they put on is happening Thursday, October 21st at 7 p.m. There's more information in your bulletin on that one. Uh, it's going to be at the Melville uh, Marriott. And so there's more information in your bulletin. Again, um, sign up by October 19th. And if you have any questions with that, you can see Michelle, Michelle Costa next week, and uh, she'll get you connected with all the information you need for Salvview Pregnancies Dinner. Trunk or Treat is around the corner. We're excited about that one. Uh, this is our fifth annual Trunk or Treat. Very excited. Happening on Halloween Day, October 31st, 2.30 to 5. Okay, right, Halloween's actually on a Sunday this year. So it's happening right after service. So there is sign-ups available for you in the back today. Um, if you would like to do a trunk, you can decorate that again in any theme you would like. And um, there's also another sign up just for general help that day. So if you would like to help out, serve in some way, serve food, um, you can sign up today. We, we want everybody to be a part of Trunk or Treat. It's really, really exciting and uh, just looking forward to a great time with that. Again, more information to come. Save the date. Again, if you know you're going to be there, sign up today. Last one. Very important one. All right, uh, we have our, what we're calling our Building Grace Vision Dinner. So you know uh, that we are in the process of acquiring the property right next door uh, to us. And on Sunday, November 14th at 530, we're going to have a dinner uh, to celebrate that and a vision for what, you know, we're going to use the property for. All right, and so everyone who calls their great, calls Grace home, uh, we want you to be here. All right, November 14th is going to be happening at the Selden Fire Department, and again, it's a night of celebration as we get to look and see uh, and envision as to what God is doing in and through our church as we acquire, acquire the property next door, all right? And so we desire for every single adult uh, to be there, every older teen to be there, um, be there, November 14th. 5:30. That that time on Sunday, November 14th, is intentional because you know if you're away for the weekend or anything like that, we ask that you would make this a priority and come back a little early and be there at 5:30. Dinner's going to be at six. Again, it's a celebration. Uh, it's going to be a really, really good time. So make every effort to be there. Uh, very, very important. All right. And so uh, anyone who needs childcare for the day, and you know if you need some help financially to afford that, uh, we will cover that for you. Okay. So. Um, just keep that in mind uh, in terms of children and things like that. So um, be there. It's going to be great. Uh, Building Grace Vision Dinner. Sunday, November 14th. All right, there's information on your bulletin uh, for, all, for that announcement and every other announcement this morning. And that's it. All right. A lot of stuff all in the bulletin. Keep that in mind. And uh, I'm going to pray as we uh, just enter into a time uh, in God's word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful to be here this morning, so thankful to be able to gather together and open up your word. God, we pray that as we open up your word this morning that uh, you would speak to us. God, that, that your word would speak, that your word would be alive and, and speak to us, God. And as we continue in this study in the book of Nehemiah, God, that uh, it wouldn't even be my words, God, it would be from you. God, may you be honored, may you be glorified, may you be praised this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So this morning we get to jump back in. Actually, hold on, hold on. I forgot. Pastor Patrick is in the building today. Uh, he's sitting right back in the back. If you're wondering who the guy on the scooter is, the crazy guy on the scooter, that's our lead pastor. That's Pastor Patrick. He's totally forgot. He's in the house. He had surgery on his foot uh, this past week. Everything went well. Everything good. And uh, he's happy to be here this morning. So, yes. Yes, continue to keep him in prayer as he's uh, in recovery now. And so, again, everything went well. Uh, praise God for that. Now, Nehemiah. All right, we get to jump back into our series in the book of Nehemiah. This has been a really, really good series. I've enjoyed it. Uh, it's been 11 weeks uh, in the book to get to where we are today. And over the last couple of weeks, we've kind of made a transition uh, in the book. And so we're able to see the wall completed. So Nehemiah and company set out to complete this building project to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And we see that is completed in uh, chapter 6 of Nehemiah. But then we come to this place where we realize, okay, that's not God's full vision for this project. That God desires not just to rebuild a physical wall around the city, but he desires to rebuild the people. To, to bring them back unto himself. 
the people of God restored to the purposes that God has called them to. All right, and so we see that a couple weeks ago. We see that in the fact that after they complete the wall, they just get back to the word of God in chapter 8. They say, okay, you know, what else does the word of God say? And then that drives them to this place of conviction where they see their shortcomings. They see uh, their sins. They see their failures in light of who God is. So the word of God is simply doing what the word of God does, which drives us to conviction of our sin. And so we see that, and it drives them to this place again. Uh, and then in chapter 9, uh, what we see is just a simple contrast between God's grace, how good God is, and then on the other side, man's rebellion, how sinful we are. We are sinful people in need of God's grace. And that's where they get this realization again, this reminder of who, God's, who God is. And I think that uh, chapter 9, where we were last week, it can kind of be summed up in one verse, and that's verse 33, again, where we see this a comparison between God and us. Nehemiah 9, verse 33 says, However, you are just in all that has come upon us. You being God are just. For you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. You have dealt faithfully, but we have acted wickedly. See, they realize in, in that moment that who God is and who they are. They look at themselves, they look at their actions, they look at where they are, and they look at who God is. And so that's this major realization that they have in chapter 9. And chapter 9 is a very, very powerful chapter. As they, as they pour out their hearts, uh, it, they confess their sin, they realize their sin before a perfect, holy, and blameless God. And all of that, this whole long prayer, the longest recorded prayer in the Bible, Nehemiah chapter 9, it all boils down to the final verse, which is going to lead us into our message today as we go into chapter 10. Look at uh, the last verse of Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 38. It says, now because of all of this, so because of everything that they just covered, because of all of this conviction of their sin, we are making an agreement in writing. And on the sealed document are the names of our leaders, our Levites, and our priests. So they're making a collective agreement together. Uh, they're making a, coven a covenant in writing. Our leaders, our Levites, our priests, they sign the document, and that's actually who we see uh, is mentioned in the beginning of chapter 10. We see that they're mentioned by name of those who, who sign and seal this document. So have you ever signed, question, have you ever signed a very, very important document before? Anybody? Most of us have signed something pretty important. Maybe it was the deed to a house. Maybe you signed a bunch of different papers uh, when you bought your car. Uh, maybe you signed a contract at your current place of employment. All right, it almost seems like everything that we do that is important, that is of value, we sign. We give our signature to it. We give like our, our stamp of approval. You're committed to following through on whatever it is that you're signing. It's a commitment. It's a contract. It's a covenant. And so uh, for me, what I thought of when I thought of that was uh, a couple weeks ago, I got to officiate my very, very first wedding. And uh, with that, I got to sign the marriage license. One of them's actually in the house today, uh, not to embarrass her. But anyway, very, very important piece of paper that I got to sign in the marriage license. The most important paper I've ever signed in my life, for sure. Okay? And it's an important piece of paper with important signatures on it. Okay? So that just goes to show, like, when something is a big deal, when something is of great importance, we give our signature to it. That's what we see in Nehemiah. They give their commitment. They make a covenant with God, driven out of this conviction that we see in chapter 9. They make a covenant. They decide to put it in writing. All right? And so if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to chapter 10 of Nehemiah where uh, we're going to continue this story. All right, we're going to look at some of the details of this commitment that they make with God, uh, beginning in verse 28, where, again, we see some of these details played out uh, and what this agreement looks like for them. All right, so, again, the first part of chapter 10 just goes through uh, the list of names of those who signed the document. There's 84 names in total uh, who signed this covenant. All right, and so, really, chapter 10 is about, okay, coming out of this place where we realize we are not right with God, like, let's get right with God. Let's make a commitment to do what God has called us to do. It's an, it's an attitude adjustment. Okay, let's get right with God. Let's, let's make the relationship that we have with God the highest priority, because in the past it hasn't been. Like, let's make that our highest priority. Let's make it the priority in our nation as well. 
Okay, so it's a direct result of where they come from in previous chapters. It's a, it's a continuous story, really, chapters 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, as, you know, even though it's a new chapter, it continues on this same path, the same story, and the same development. All right, so the leaders, the Levites, the priests, they sign as representatives for the whole nation. It's not that they are the only 84 that are making this deal, making this uh, promise to God. They're signing on behalf of the whole nation. All right, why? I, I'm not sure why 84, but maybe it wouldn't fit on the whole scroll. Like, I don't know. Maybe that many names aren't going to fit. All right, so 84 people sign on behalf of the nation, and that's where we are, verse 28. It says this. Now the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, all those who had knowledge and understanding are joining with their kinsmen, their nobles, and are taking on themselves a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given to them through Moses, God's servant, and to keep and to observe all the commandments of God, our Lord, and his ordinances and his statutes. All right, so here we are. That in, we see that in addition to those 84 people, those 84 names who seal the document, the rest of the people, all those who had knowledge and understanding, they make this covenant. I mean, this is a united people right here. And what did they agree to? Did you notice that? It says that they agree to follow God's law and they agree to enter into a curse and an oath. Right? So they agree to accept a curse from God if they do not obey his law, all right? That's the whole point of this, this commitment, this getting right with God. They're seeking to put him first and seeking to obey what his word uh, commands of them, making his word the highest priority, all right? And then the details that follow in these next few verses that we're going to get into in just a second uh, really just talk about what this looks like practically. Okay, it's good. Yeah, yeah, we're going to make a covenant with God. What does that mean? We're going to, you know, make this promise to God that we're going to follow through, but you know, it's all well and good, but you've got to follow through on it, okay? And so we see some of the details that they commit unto God. And the first one begins in verse 30, all right? We see the first detail uh, while walking in this covenant, what that looks like for them. And first is a commitment to holiness, a commitment to holiness. Nehemiah 10, verse 30, it says, And that we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Okay, so this is number one on the list. The people of God were to be set apart, and one of those areas, as we know, is in regard to marriage. All right, they're making a commitment to be set apart, to be holy, set apart from the world, all right? And as we know, and as they even know, this isn't some new concept, okay? This isn't something new that they're making an agreement to, all right? It's been stressed elsewhere in Scripture, even as recent as in the book of Ezra, the book right before this. Uh, it's a big topic, all right? So it's not something new, but why are they making this priority number one? They're making this deal with God, and now the first thing that they bring up, the first area that they mention is in regard to marriage. Why is that the number one priority? Well, because it was obviously an issue, all right? They're making a commitment to God, a recommitment to God to, to fix some things that they were doing wrong, some things that they were going against God's word. You know, this is one that, that they hadn't been following at the time and so um if again he talks about intermarriage here and it's not an issue of race right? it's not an issue of race it's an issue of faith when he talks about intermarriage it says you know if, if again if there were to be intermarriage with the people of the land then that's going to introduce a whole lot of stuff it's going to open up a whole can of worms um, of practices and ideas and, uh, and idols and false gods that went against the faith that they had in their God. They didn't want that to have an influence any longer. I mean, think back to why the people of Israel were in exile in the first place. What were they doing? They were worshiping other gods. They were uh, in idolatry, and it led to God's judgment and ultimately led to them being exiled. But now here in Nehemiah chapter 10, this conviction that they've been in you know, for the last couple chapters has led them to a place of commitment where they're saying, okay, you know, we're going to start to live this out. We're going to get back on path for what God has called us to do and who he's called us to be. You know, and, and this is an important principle for um, us to even 
follow today. Paul speaks on this in the New Testament as well. All right, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, it says this. It says, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? See, this idea of being bound together or yoked together with unbelievers, it, okay, it's not just limited to marriage, okay? But marriage is certainly an important aspect of that. Like, God desires for our marriages, God desires for our relationships to be of people who are bound together uh, with, you know, we want to be bound together with someone who's going to help us in our relationship and in our pursuit of Jesus, it's a principle in the Old Testament, and it's a principle principle for us to follow even today. You know, growing up, this is one principle that my parents certainly were sure to instill in me, um, big time. It might have been the first verse I memorized, I don't know. But this was a big one, because, you know, my parents instilled in me that, you know, God has standards for marriage and what it is to look like, that my future spouse will share in the same faith that I have in Christ. That's what God has called us to do. And if we're going to be obedient to God's word, then we're going to do what it says. And I'm going to do what it says to make sure that, uh, you know, my future spouse has the same faith in Jesus Christ that I have myself. All right? And so that's first in our passage. He talks about marriage. All right? Israel's committed to not letting that happen again, not letting um, the outside influence to infiltrate uh, what they have going on in their pursuit of the things of God and in the pursuit of being the people that God has called them to be. Okay, that's number one. The second decision that they make here is found in verse 31, and it's in regard to the Sabbath, okay? They make a commitment to be obedient before God. Look at verse 31. It says this, As for the peoples of the land who bring Wares or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day. And we will forego the crops the seventh year in the exaction of every debt. Okay, so we know at the Sabbath, right, to be a day of rest. And under Old Testament law, God said that there was to be no buying, there was to be no selling on the Sabbath day. Okay, and so similar to the one before that we just came out of of marriage, like this is a law, obviously, that if they're recommitting, it was being broken. They weren't following what God had called them to do. They were being disobedient in how they handled and how they misused the Sabbath, breaking the law. And now here in Nehemiah, what we see is they're saying, okay, we're going to observe, observe the Sabbath the way that God has commanded us to do so. You know, I think a lot of times in our world, we sometimes blow over passages like this about the Sabbath because, well, you know, we're not under that anymore, or we don't follow that anymore. But I think we can learn something pretty cool if we just sit in this and realize, okay, what does this mean for them? Okay, what does this mean? What does this look like back in their day, okay? Because I think that this is one, in regard to how they follow the Sabbath and, the, and this covenant that they're making with God, this is one that is going to require a lot of faith, a lot of faith, okay? It's going to show um, just how much trust, just how much faith you have in God. Why? Because they're going to say, okay, I'm no longer going to buy or sell on the Sabbath, meaning that everyone else around me is going to have an advantage in terms of, you know, they're buying and selling on that day, meaning I'm going to do less than everybody else around me, and I'm going to trust in God to provide for me. Okay, and on top of that, what else is mentioned? Not just the Sabbath day. It says here at the end of verse 31, we will forego the crops the seventh year in the exaction of every debt. So every seventh year, they were to give the land a rest, its own Sabbath, every seventh year. And that's a requirement for the people of God who are making this covenant to ultimately trust in God alone. Right? They're making an agreement to say, okay, we're going to do our business, we're going to do our dealings of buying and selling the way that God desires us 
to do it. And, and we're going to have the correct approach to the Sabbath, one that is different from what we're coming out of in, in our disobedience. It requires a lot of faith. You know, it's basically saying, okay, uh, I'm going to get this out of my hands, and I'm going to put it in your hands, God. Because a lot of times we think we have control, but if we give it to God, that requires trust, that requires faith in him to do so. All right, and so again, going back to this this seventh year, we see this passage that you know is referenced in, in Leviticus chapter 25, all right, and that's on the screen for you. It says this. It says, you shall thus observe my statutes and keep my judgments so as to carry them out, that you may live securely on the land. Then the land will yield its produce so that you can eat your fill and live securely on it. But if you say, what are we going to eat on the seventh year if we do not sow or gather in our crops? Then I will so order my blessing for you the sixth year that it will bring forth crops for three years. All right. So it says, OK, well, OK, if we have a question about like, OK, uh, God, if you don't want us to uh, sow or bring in crops in the seventh year, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? He says, then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth crops enough for three years. See, that's what our, our, our trust and our faith and our obedience to God can look like as we trust in him ultimately as our provider. See, it's about trusting in God or, or finding our rest, if you will. Again, the Sabbath meaning rest, finding our rest in who he is, not in who we are. You know, one of my favorite stories when I was younger, especially, was the story of Jesus' feeding of the 5,000. And, you know, this one kind of jumps out to me uh, because, so if you're not familiar with the feeding of, of the 5,000 that Jesus performed, uh, it's a miracle, one. And uh, what happens is, you know, Jesus is able to use, there's a big crowd gathered, Jesus is able to use just a really, really small uh, offering from a young boy that has that of, of five loaves and two fish. Five loaves and two fish, and he multiplies that. And is able to feed the entire crowd that is there. 5,000 men and then women and children as well. So it's a miracle. It's a miracle. But I want us to think about that in terms of our passage this morning. I mean, God used such a simple offering of five loaves and two fish. And he's able to do something miraculous with it. And I get that that's a miracle that Jesus performed. But I think there's something that we can grasp in there as it relates to our trust in Jesus. You know, think about the five loaves and the two fish as something that we offer, something that we bring to the table. It's not much, right? Not a whole lot. And look at what God can do with it if we give it to him, if we trust him, if we're obedient to him, that he ultimately is going to be our provider. He ultimately is going to sustain us if we trust in him. That's where our trust belongs, is in God, with, with our stuff, with our belongings, with our finances with our work, with it all. He deserves it. All right, the last few verses of our passage cover one more uh, area of this covenant that they're making with God. And I think it can really be summed up. We're going to read the whole thing. But it can be summed up in the final verse of the chapter, verse 39. It says, thus we will not neglect the house of our God. That's this whole thing. They're making a commitment to no longer neglect the house of God, but to now support the house of God. All right. So this is a commitment to participation. This last one, commitment to participation. Look what it says, uh, Nehemiah 10, verse 32. It says, we also placed ourselves under obligation to contribute yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. For the showbread, for the continual grain offering, for the continual burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moon, for the appointed times, for the holy things and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. Likewise, we cast lots for the supply of wood among the priests, the Levites and the people, so that they might bring it to the house of our God according to our father's households at fixed times annually to burn on the altar of the Lord our God, as it is written in the law, and that they might bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruits of every tree to the house of our Lord annually. 
and bring to the house of our God the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks, as it is written in the law, for the priests who are ministering in the house of our God. We will also bring the first of our dough, our contributions, the first or the fruit of every tree, the new wine and the oil to the priests at the chambers of the house of our God, and the tithe of our ground to the Levites, for the Levites are they who receive the tithes in all our towns. The priest, the son of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes. And the Levites shall bring us the tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chamber of the storehouse. For the sons of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of the grain, the new wine, and the oil to the chambers. There are the utensils of the sanctuary, the priests who are ministering, the gatekeepers, and the singers. Thus, we will not neglect the house of our God. That's the end of the chapter. And if that last phrase looks like it was repeated a lot, it's because it was. Nine times in these verses we see that they are doing this to not neglect the house of their God. They commit to the house of God. It's all about God for them at this point. It's about honoring his house. They're committing to the support of the temple. The house of God, the, the ministry that, that happens of the Levites and the priests, they're committed to all of that. They're all in on the things of God. That's the agreement. And then look at some of the highlights of the ways that they commit to being all in. It says they offer an offering to the Lord to, bring for, to, bring for, uh, to provide for the burnt offerings and for the wood to keep the altar burning. They had to do that. Okay, they're committed to bringing their first fruits of the, to the temple. They're committed to uh, bringing their firstborn children and animals to the Lord and committing them to the Lord as a commitment to pay the tithe as well. All right, that's the last one we see, a commitment to pay their tithe. And so this whole chapter really is about commitment or recommitment, if you will. Back to God's purposes, back to God's will, back to what God desires for his people. You know, in a, in a practical way of doing that, back then, is in, you know, how they treat the house of God, how they treat the temple. One commentator put it this way, it's not on the screen, but just listen, it says, it is not only the best that belongs to God, but also the first. It would be presumptuous for man to enjoy something without first giving God his portion. It would be presumptuous for man to enjoy something without first giving God his portion. All that to say that God wants our best. God wants our first. God doesn't want our leftovers. You don't even want your leftovers. God doesn't want our leftovers. He wants our best. So what are we giving him? That's something to think about. What are, what are we giving him? Again, similar to what we see with the Sabbath, it's a matter of faith. How much faith do you have in God as your provider? And in your faith to him, do you give him back the first fruits or the leftovers? See, it's an act of worship to display your faith in God in this way. The same principle can apply to us today, to give our first to God, to give our best for God. Right? It might not be required like it was then for believers to, to tithe or to give but we should still treat that like an act of worship unto God as something that we get to do for God. There's a lot of ways we can worship, right? A lot of times we think of worship only as a time when, you know, we sing three or four songs and then someone comes up and talks. Right? That's not the only time that worship can happen. Worship can happen by what we're doing right now, studying the word of God. Worship can happen by um by praying to God, by in through your relationship with him, that you can worship him for who he is as you walk out and live out your relationship with him. And then worship can happen uh, by giving God, of our, giving God our time, giving God our talent, giving God our treasure. See, it's not something that, again, we have to do or required to do under the Old Testament law. It's something that we get to do as an act of worship unto God. We get to do it in support of building God's kingdom. It's a privilege. And it should be treated as a privilege as well. All right. So again, see, in their submission to the word of God, the people of God in Nehemiah, they commit to building and to supporting the house of God. They're committing to building the kingdom. 
Remember, this book of Nehemiah isn't just about the physical walls built around the city. This is about building the people of God. That's what it's about. And to multiply and to build his kingdom, to see God's vision expand. All right? And so, you know, we think of, we know of our mission here at Grace Gospel Church. We say it uh, probably every week. It's right up here on these walls. You can't miss it. Exalting Christ and pointing others to him. Okay, but we have another statement that we cling to here at Grace Gospel Church uh, which is our vision, a.k.a. how we live out, how we do our mission, and that is that we desire to be a Holy Spirit-empowered movement of God on mission to multiply his kingdom. See, we desire to live on mission by God, through God, to multiply his kingdom, not our kingdom. And that's the commitment that they're making. It's all about God. It's not about us. I can be used as an instrument in the hands of God, but it's not about me. It's about him, and it's about his glory, all right? And so what they're doing is they're, they're recalibrating, if you will. They're refocusing, recommitting themselves to the mission that God has called them to. And remember, again, these, these last few chapters of the book of Nehemiah kind of flow together as one story. It's the same process, the same progress within the story as we see the conviction that happens uh, when they read the word of God and, and they're aware of their sin, and that causes them to do something as they, as they make this covenant with God. It's like a revival. And we talked about that last week. Remember Tony Evans, a definition of revival is that biblical revival is when people are revived to do God's agenda and to live their lives in light of his holiness. There are people being revived to do God's agenda and no longer their own. Chapter 8 and 9, they make this covenant. Out of chapter 8 and 9, they then make this covenant with God. And again, they say in chapter 9, that it's because of all of this that we are making an agreement in writing, and they sign it. All right, so what are the three areas that we looked at this morning? The first one, they make a commitment to holiness. They can make a commitment to be set apart for God in relation to their marriage. They make a commitment to be obedient to God and his word with their dealings and how they're going to manage the Sabbath and how they're going to follow God's word in that. And then they make a commitment to participate. They make a commitment to be all in on the things of God, the house of God, and the work of God. So what's the application for us today? See, very similar, similarly to what we see in the book of Nehemiah, God wants us to be committed. God desires for our heart to be right with him, committed to him above everything else. To show how committed they were, they, they signed a document on behalf of the whole nation to show how committed they were to God. They submit their marriage, they submit their dealings on the Sabbath, and they commit to the supporting and building of the house of God. And you see, I think the commitment as it relates to what we're talking about in our context is by putting our relationship that we have with Jesus first. To make that the highest priority that we have in our life, to put Jesus above everything else. That's what it looks like to be sold out for Christ. That's what it looks like to be all in, to be committed to his cause. Again, God doesn't want our leftovers. God wants our first. He desires to be first in our life, our relationship with Jesus above everything else. Make that the highest priority. And how do we do that? We do that by being obedient to his word and his calling on our life. So they made a commitment. And the truth is this morning that we can make a commitment with God as well. All right, maybe, you know, maybe for a while, I don't know, maybe you've been doing your own thing. Maybe, you know, the Bible has been on the shelf because life is good. You don't really need to talk to the big man upstairs anymore because life is good right now. Maybe like the people in Nehemiah, we need to make a commitment to God. We need to commit ourselves back to him, back to the truth of his word, and place that as the highest priority in our life. Or maybe, you know, you, you know you're saved. You know you have a relationship with Jesus. You know you're in. But this whole trusting God thing, like this whole like trusting him with everything is like a new concept or one that's kind of hard to get. That, that everything 
belongs to him. Everything. He doesn't want our leftovers. He wants our service unto him to be first. Maybe that's something that's difficult to grasp from time to time. If we're being honest, it is for some of us, for all of us at certain times. To commit to God everything. To always have him be the highest authority. Always have him be there as the first priority in our life. But he wants us to commit. That's the message today. Commit. Commit to him. What does that look like for you? I don't know. You know, that's something that you have to do business with God with to say, okay, what is it? What will it look like? What can it look like for me to be more committed, for me to be more sold out in my relationship that I have with Jesus? You know, some practical things. You know, it can be, um, it can be as simple as saying, okay, we've got a life group starting up this week, this Wednesday. Maybe I'll commit for however long it is, eight to ten weeks, to be a part of a life group this year. That's, that's a commitment that you can make in Christ to, to make him the highest priority in your life. So maybe it's that. Maybe it's saying, okay, I'm going to commit to praying before work every single morning because I need it. All right? Because I need to make God the highest priority and I need to start my day by spending time in the word, by spending time in prayer before I even go to work. Maybe that's an action step that you can take in order to have Christ be the first priority. All right, or maybe it's related to our finances. All right, I'm going to trust God with my finances. You know, it's easy to trust God when the bank account's looking like it should or like we desire it to be. You know, but where does our trust in God, what does it look like when there's questions, when there's doubts, when there's fears, when there's anxieties, when there's worries, when there's things that you aren't sure of how things are going to play out. But our, our trust in God needs to be the same, whether it's what we desire it to be or whether it's not, because we need to put in obedience our faith in him and who he is as our provider. So maybe that's what it is. Maybe that you need to trust in God as your ultimate provider. That's the challenge. Commit to God. Commit to God. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for who you are this morning. So thankful that, that you call us unto yourself. And God, you want us to be all in. You want us to be sold out in our relationship with you. Not the 17th priority, not somewhere on the list, not something I do or I can cling to if I have time, but God, you desire to be first in our lives and in our hearts. And God, it is my prayer this morning that each of us would think about what that can look like in our life. Practically, how can we show that you are our highest authority, you're our highest priority as we commit to you. God, help us to do that. Help us to, to seek that prayerfully and boldly so that our life with you, our relationship with you may be stronger, may be better. And God, we will give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory for that. that we made uh, here at Grace Gospel Church actually over these last uh, now 20 or so days is to is to pray, all right, and, and, and to pray specifically. We're a church that prays um, beyond just 28 days, get that, but we've, we have a specific calendar that we have um, to pray through, 
Um, and so we're now about three weeks into that, one week left. And so, um, you know, we're calling it 28 Days of Prayer. And during that, we're asking everybody to pray. Everybody who calls Grace Gospel Church home to pray. And there's there's one of those calendars in your bulletin today. There's some more on the back table. And so, um, you know, even if you haven't for these three weeks, do it this week. Commit to God. Find a time in your day that you can pray and you can pray for uh, our church, Grace Gospel Church. And uh, you can pray for through some of the specifics that we have on that calendar as it relates to mi- ministry, as it relates to, you know, the missionaries that we have. We send emails out about uh, what our missionaries need prayer for, okay? And so stop and pray, all right? And we've actually, you know, over these last few weeks, it's been really cool. We've had a time in our service to pray uh, to God corporately. And so uh, we're going to enter into a time of doing that here in just a moment. I've asked a few people uh, to pray our church and for the ministry here at Grace and uh, pray even for some of these priorities that we have, um, these overriding prayers that we've asked everybody to pray for that are at the top of that calendar, uh, and we're asking you to pray every single day, and those uh, are on the screen now, and so that our congregation would have a deep commitment to God and His mission. Man, we want to be all in here at Grace Gospel Church, that we would be committed to God and committed to the mission that He's called us to, of exalting Christ and pointing others to Him. That's what we desire here. The second one is that every person would utilize their gifts to build the kingdom. Just like in Nehemiah, they're about building the kingdom. And it's not about a wall. It's about building the kingdom of God. And every single person that calls Grace Gospel Church home has a role to play in that. And so would we find that? Would we do that? Would we live that out according to what God has for us? The third thing that we're asking everybody to pray for over these 28 days is for growth Uh, At Grace, of course, we want to grow because we teach the word of God here, all right? And and we are praying specifically for young families to come and and to stay here at Grace Gospel Church to to get connected and to uh, just feel a part of the body here at Grace. That's our third uh, prayer priority. And then the fourth one is to pray for the one. And this is uh, more of an individual thing, but uh, very, 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 very important, uh, you know, to pray for the one, the one person that you desire to come to Christ. And I get that there might be several pray for somebody. You know, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, in this room, you you know somebody that isn't walking with the Lord. You know someone that doesn't have that relationship with Jesus. Would you pray for them? Would you pray even for, for boldness uh, to share the gospel with them if you haven't? Or to share the gospel with them again if you have? All right, and so those are, those are some of our four uh, prayer priorities uh, here at Grace Gospel Church. Uh, over these 28 days and beyond. And again, I've asked uh, several people to pray um, uh, during the service today. And so uh, you can go ahead and, and bow your heads in prayer as we, as we do that together. Lord Jesus, I'm so thankful to you for just your goodness and your grace to us every single day. And I'm just I'm thankful for this congregation of grace and just being just blessed to be a part of the church that does exalt you and that puts you first um, and really uh, seeks to live life um, in light of your holiness and your goodness. Lord, uh, just continue to guide our feet today to meet you and continue to help us to be on mission all the time. We pray for ways that we can continue to share your life and your love to those around us. Um, I pray that you would uh, just, just give us a love Father, we just come before you saying thank you. Thank you for who you are, for what you do, for how good you take care of us each and every day. Thank you for your son Jesus and him dying on a cross for forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to help us, God, to help us each and every day. And God, I just ask that we be bold enough um, to invite our friends and our family and our neighbors to Grace Gospel Church, God hear your word and to hear your truth and I just ask that you give us the willingness and the boldness God to do that and to do it in love and God I lift up the faith in blue outreach tomorrow to you and just pray for good weather and again that we have the boldness to 
ask and invite our friends and neighbors, co-workers even, God, people that are off tomorrow. And again, a trunk or treat, God. Again, that you will give us that boldness to invite the people you want us to invite. And let lives be changed and hearts turned towards your son, Jesus. Help us not to neglect your house, as your word tells us. Help us to be all in and to be committed to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the righteous, loving, all-powerful presence, God, that you are. And I just pray, Father, help us to grow stronger in our commitment to you. Reveal to each one of us your mission to grow your kingdom. I pray that our eyes would be open to see, our ears would be open to hear all that you have for us. Let us take that next step to walk a closer walk with you. Help us to give our best to you. Thank you, Father. We love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Father God, we do love you. We thank you for your grace, mercy, and love to us. Lord, we don't deserve anything of you. We don't deserve your grace that you continuously pour on us. We don't deserve the love that you've shown us, especially in Jesus Christ, Father. And yet, it flows and it continues to flow. We thank you for that. So, Father, I pray that we would be that people that would see ourselves in light of you. That, Lord, where we need to change, we would change. Where we need to repent, we would repent. And that out of that might come a commitment that is complete and total to you and to your mission. Father, Nehemiah is so awesome because he was a man so committed to your mission that he was willing to give up every lifestyle, everything for you. Father, may, may we understand that. May we be a people of your program. May we be a people who, who are willing to dive in completely, to sacrifice totally, that your kingdom might move forward. Father, fill us with your spirit, that we might know you, and that your power might shine in and through us. Again, that your your kingdom would be multiplied for your glory. Lord, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. God, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you that we can we can come to you in prayer on behalf of our church. God, I pray that every single person, again, that calls Grace Gospel Church home, find their place, would, would, would find their place in, in how they can serve what you're calling them to do, who you're calling them to be in Christ and using their gifts to build your kingdom. God, it's all about your kingdom. It's not about us in any way. God, we have a, a mission here of, of exalting Christ, of exalting your son and pointing others to him. God, I pray that as a church, we would do that with boldness, with love, with compassion to others, God, that, that we would just be a light here in this community around us, God, that we would we would be a light for you. God, and that, and that through the work here, through what we do here at Grace Gospel Church, that, that you alone would receive the glory, that you alone would be exalted, and that you alone would be pointed to. We love you. God, we thank you. And we, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning we get to uh, take of communion together. And so I'm going to invite our, our service to come and do that. And uh, yeah, uh, we're going to say goodbye to our online crowd uh, this morning. Thank you for uh, tuning in with us this morning. We're glad that you uh, were with us and able to join us.
So here at Grace Gospel Church, we take uh, a communion together uh, once a month uh, to remember uh, what, what God has done for us in sending his son. Uh, on this 